today's lecture, I'm going to finally get around to deriving the equation for the damped driven harmonic oscillator. Okay, so here we go. We've been leading up to this. So we've already covered the solution to the simple harmonic oscillator in a previous lecture, and we've also already covered the damped harmonic oscillator. But now we're moving on to talking about the damped driven harmonic oscillator. Now there's a lot of oscillatory systems out there that have a sinusoidal or periodic driving force, clocks, rate monitors, my personal favorite atomic force microscopes, but um, we haven't really covered how to model that experimentally before. And there's a lot of important um, applications to this, and so the equations that come out of it are super important for physics, so here we go. We're going to model the um, system as being driven sinusoidally, and we're going to assume that there's some kind of scenario or some equivalent um, shown over here. You have a piston or some you know, machine engine that's driving it sinusoidally. So you have, instead of a fixed wall, a movable wall, and the spring is attached to that movable wall and the piston is driving it back and forth. And then we are going to assume that we have a mass um, attached to that piston by the spring sliding on um, the floor here, and that the um, uh, frictional force here could be modeled as viscous friction. Okay, so that's what we're going to assume. Now we could start our clock anywhere, so we may as well start it with our driving force phase constant equal to zero. Why not, right? So let's say that our driving force um, is some amplitude F naught, so it's driving it with some amplitude of force F naught, times cosine of omega sub d times t. Now here, omega sub d here is the driving frequency, the driving angular frequency, and t is time. All right, so that's our equation for the drive force. Now if we think about what our free body diagram in x would be, we are now going to have three forces, right? We've got um, the spring force, viscous friction, and our drive force. So if we do our sum of the forces in the x direction, which we set equal to ma by Newton's second law, the sum of those forces will be the spring force minus kx, um, and the, then the viscous friction minus cv, and then finally the drive force plus f naught cosine omega sub d times t. Okay, so that's the, that's the sum of the forces. Now we're going to write um, each one of our uh, variables a and v in terms of their derivatives of their position x. And so rearranging the equation, putting the drive force on one side and everything else on the so other side, we would have f naught cosine omega dt equaling to ma, which is m d squared x dt squared, the second order time derivative of the position is the acceleration, plus kx plus cv, and remember that v is dx dt, okay? Now we're going to divide through by m because it's kind of bad form to have anything multiplying your second or your largest order derivative. So that means that you have f naught over m times cosine omega dt is equaling to d squared x dt squared plus k over mx plus c over m dx dt. All right, so that's the equation that we must solve. Now, in all of our other um, solutions to these differential equations, we've taken the tactic of guess and check, okay? I'll leave other things to your um, differential equations professor, okay? I'm going to let the math department handle that one. Um, so what's our guess this time? And let's remember um, some of our variable terms from previous guesses as well, okay? So remember for the simple um, harmonic oscillator, the undamped, undriven oscillator, we said that our natural or resonant frequency for our system, omega naught, is the square root of k over m. So we're going to use that variable again this time just as kind of a shorthand. And for our damped harmonic oscillator, we defined a damping constant gamma, which was c over m. So we're going to use that again as well. Okay? Now our regular simple harmonic oscillator equation was just a sinusoidal function. x of t is equal to a times cosine omega naught t plus v, where we had some, um, some phase constant. Okay, and our phase constant in that case, um, actually I'm going to call this v prime, okay, so that you can tell that it's different from the v that I'm getting ready to derive. Okay, so that phase constant there um, is going to be different from our new one, 
And of course, we're not going to assume that the system would oscillate at its natural resonant frequency because we're driving it. And so if anything, we would guess that once the system settles out, that it would oscillate at the frequency at which it is driven. I mean, that just makes sense, right? It's going to oscillate at the frequency that it's being driven at. But it might not respond in a timely fashion. So for example, you might have the drive and then there's a lag in between the driving force and the response of the system. You can't assume that it happens immediately. That doesn't kind of match with our physical intuition. Now we would also not assume that after things had settled out anyway, that the, um, the amplitude would change with time, okay? Because it's being constantly supplied with energy. So even though energy is being sucked out of the system, there's also energy put into the system by the drive force. And so we would assume that after some transient time, our steady state solution would have a constant amplitude that would balance out those two competing factors. And so we're gonna assume that we have some constant amplitude. Okay, so what we're going to do is guess this solution, x of t is equal to some constant a cosine omega dt plus b. Okay, that's going to be our guess. And then we're going to plug into that and solve for what our undetermined amplitude is and what our um, phase constant is. All right, so let's check. So what we have to do to do our guess and check solution is to take our first and second order derivatives or position of our guess with respect to time. And so that means that dx dt, the derivative of cosine is a minus sine. That would be minus omega d a sine omega dt plus b. And our second order derivative would then be the derivative of the velocity, which would give us minus a omega d squared cosine omega dt plus b. All right. Now we're going to plug that back in to our equation, um, which is f naught over m cosine omega dt equaling to d squared x dt squared plus k over mx plus c over m dx dt. Now, I'm going to start at this point using my shorthand that omega is equal to the square root of k over m. Omega naught is the square root of k over m. So that means that k over m is omega naught squared. So I'm going to plug that in. Okay. And then I'm also going to use the um, previously defined variable gamma is equal to c over m. So that's going to be in there. Okay. And then I'm going to plug in my derivatives of my guesses. And so that means that I've got f naught over m cosine omega dt is equal to minus a omega d squared cosine omega dt plus b plus omega a omega naught squared cosine omega dt plus b minus gamma omega d a sine omega dt plus b. So that's a mouthful, but there it is all written out with my guesses plugged in. Okay, now I've got a couple of terms with cosine omega dt plus b in that right hand side, so I'm going to group those like terms. And that gives me f naught over m cosine omega dt equaling a times omega naught squared minus omega d squared times cosine omega dt plus b minus gamma omega d a sine omega dt plus b. Okay, so in order to figure out what our undetermined constants are, which is the a and the b, we need to be able to group like terms, but that's difficult because we have a cosine omega dt on one side, and on the other side we have cosine omega dt plus b. But there are trig identities that can help me out. So since we have that mix of terms with and without a phase constant, let's figure out how to get rid of that. So the trig identities of choice for this are cosine omega dt plus b equals to cosine omega dt times cosine b, minus sine omega dt sine of b. Okay, so we can use that, and now you can see that um, the b is no longer in the argument with the omega dt for my, um, for my trig identity there, using my trig identity. And I can also use sine omega dt plus b equals sine omega dt cosine b plus cosine omega dt times sine b. And now I'm going to use that trig identity and plug it in. So I've color-coded it here. I've got the red um, term. I'm going to plug that in for the cosine omega dt plus b, which I've also colored red. And then I have my blue term, right? Um, and I'm going to plug that trig identity in where the sine omega dt plus b is. All right, so when I do that, when I plug those trig identities in, you can see what happens. I've got f naught over m cosine omega dt equals 2 a omega naught squared minus omega d squared times, and now here's where I plug in my trig identity, cosine omega dt, cosine b, minus sine omega dt, sine b. 
And now I'm going to plug in the sine omega dt plus v trig identity minus gamma omega dA times sine omega dt cosine phi plus cosine omega dt sine phi. So I've got that plugged in there. Okay? So now you see I can group like terms. What I'm going to do is rearrange this equation yet again. I'm going to get everything that's multiplying the cosine omega dt, I'm going to group that. And then the things that multiply the sine omega dt, I'm going to group those. See? All right. So, copying that equation over from the previous slide and now grouping like terms. On the left-hand side, I'm going to leave that alone. I've got F0 over M cosine omega dt. Leave that alone. And now on the right-hand side, I'm going to group the terms that multiply the cosine omega dt. When I do that, I've got cosine omega dt times A times omega naught squared minus omega d squared times cosine phi minus gamma omega d A sine phi. So that stuff in square brackets right there, that's everything that is in the top equation that was multiplying cosine omega dt on the right-hand side. Now, grouping the sine omega dt terms, I've got plus sine omega dt times minus a omega naught squared minus omega d squared sine phi minus gamma omega dA cosine phi. So, everything that was multiplying sine omega dt on the right-hand side is now grouped together. All right. So, now we can match terms on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. In other words, on the left-hand side, the stuff that's multiplying cosine omega dt has to equal the stuff on the right-hand side that multiplies cosine omega dt. And second verse, same as the first for the sine omega dt. Except for the sine, there is no left-hand side. So, those terms have to equal to zero. So, since that's probably the simpler thing to do, let's do that one first, right? Always do the simpler thing first. Get it done. That's my motto. So there's no sine omega dt terms on the left-hand side, so it's zero is equal to the stuff that multiplies sine omega dt on the right. So the stuff that multiplies sine omega dt on the right is minus a omega naught squared minus omega d squared sine phi minus gamma omega d a cosine phi. So that means that I have this relatively simple equation. Okay, I'm not saying it's simple, but it's relatively simple compared to what we've been dealing with. And so I can equate... Um, if I add the gamma omega dA cosine phi to both sides, then I can set these things equal, and I have minus A omega naught squared minus omega d squared sine phi equals gamma omega dA cosine phi. Hey, we have a sine phi and a cosine phi. Let's divide that out and make a tangent of phi, and then cross multiply. So we have sine phi cosine phi divided by cosine phi equals tangent of phi, which is, we're getting there, I'm getting excited, minus gamma omega d divided by omega naught squared minus omega d squared. So, that means that I have an expression for phi in terms of things that I know. So, phi is equal to the inverse tangent of minus gamma omega d divided by omega naught squared minus omega d squared. Yay! There's phi. There's one of our undetermined constants. Let's tackle the other one. Okay, we can do that if we do the cosine terms. All right? I told you this one was more complicated. Here we go. If we look at our original expression, here's our original equation. I just copied and pasted it from the other slide, so this is not new, okay? And now I'm going to take the stuff that multiplies cosine omega d on the left-hand side and set it equal to the stuff that multiplies cosine omega dt on the right-hand side. So that means that I've got F0 over M is equal to A omega naught squared minus omega d squared cosine phi minus gamma omega d a sine phi. Okay? Now, we want to solve for our next undetermined constant a. So, a multiplies both factors on this right-hand side. I can factor it out and then divide by that factor. Okay? So, a would equal to f naught over m divided by omega naught squared minus omega d squared cosine phi minus gamma omega d sine phi. Okay? Now, if you're getting lost in the algebra and you need a minute, please remember you can always pause me, okay? So this is a nice factor of this compared to class. Now, technically, I do have a solution here. I've already determined phi, so I could be done. Hmm? I could be done. But it's kind of bad form to leave one undetermined constant in terms of the other if you can get out of it. So since we can, let's fix that, okay? Now, to get out of it and fix it, I'm going to go back to my definition for phi, okay? 
So remember I had sine phi divided by cosine phi equals minus gamma omega d over omega naught squared minus omega d squared. Okay, so if I look at this, here's a little math trick. Um, I could say that, you know, sine phi is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So here's my little right triangle. So sine phi would be the opposite over the hypotenuse. I'll call the hypotenuse h. And cosine phi would be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Okay, so I could say, I don't know exactly what my hypotenuse is yet, but I could write it this way. Sine phi divided by h, you know, and so on and so forth. So I've got sine phi now is equal to minus gamma omega d divided by the hypotenuse, and then divided by cosine of phi, omega naught squared minus omega d squared divided by my hypotenuse. Okay, so that would give me this arrangement here for my right triangle. Okay, but... I know what my hypotenuse is if I know the legs of a triangle. So it's just the square root of the sum of the squares of the legs of the right triangle. So that means that my hypotenuse would be the square root of gamma squared omega d squared plus omega naught squared minus omega d squared squared. And so I could write my hypotenuse in that way. So this is the little trick we're going to use, right? So that would mean that sine of phi would be minus gamma omega d divided by the square root of gamma squared omega d squared plus omega naught squared minus omega d squared squared. Say that not times fast. It is, you know, National Tongue Twister Day today, I heard on the radio, so this is appropriate for me. All right, so then cosine of phi would be equal to omega naught squared minus omega d squared divided by the square root of omega, gamma squared omega d squared plus omega naught squared minus omega d squared squared. Okay, so... Now I have my undetermined constant phi in terms of things that I do know, right? Okay, great. And you're probably thinking to yourself, she just made the equation even bigger. This is not helpful, but I'll show you. Okay, so if I take this, right, here was my original equation for A with the phi's in it. But now I plug in for cosine phi and sine phi, okay, what I saw. So then I have this awful looking thing here. A is equal to F naught over M divided by this hot mess. But look, here's this hot mess. It's not as bad as you might think. I have in the denominator omega naught squared minus omega d squared times cosine phi, which is omega naught squared minus omega d squared divided by the square root of this thing. Okay? But see here in the numerator, I've got omega naught squared minus omega d squared times omega naught squared minus omega d squared. So those things are just squared there, okay? Now, the same thing happens with the sine phi term. I have minus gamma omega d times sine phi, which is minus gamma omega d divided by the square root, okay? But that means that in the numerator of this little fraction down here, then I have gamma squared omega d squared, right? And then I can just take this square root up to the top. So that leaves me with a is equal to f naught over m times the square root of gamma squared omega d squared plus omega naught squared minus omega d squared squared. And then in the denominator, I just have omega naught squared minus omega d squared squared plus gamma omega d squared. But hey, look at that. I have the square root of something over the thing. So that means that I can cancel out the square root on the top and I have a is equal to f naught over m divided by the square root of gamma squared omega d squared plus omega naught squared minus omega d squared squared. So that's it. Now I have my amplitude in terms of things that I should know or be able to measure experimentally. So there it is. So I'm done. That's my solution for the damped driven harmonic oscillator. My guess worked as long as these conditions are satisfied. So my guess was x of t, the position as a function of time, is a cosine omega dt plus phi, right? And then my amplitude for my undetermined amplitude constant was f naught over m divided by the square root of gamma squared omega d squared plus omega naught squared minus omega d squared squared. And then my phase constant phi was the inverse tangent of minus gamma omega d over omega naught squared minus omega d squared. So that's it. I'm done. Okay, so it started out horrible, but I hope it ended well for you. Thank you for your attention. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.